humans are commonly uh, afflicted with neuropathic pain, and there are many, many different etiologies. Uh, some of you joining us tonight may also live with that um, or may know somebody who does. And if, if you don't or you don't know of anybody, you've certainly seen commercials for pain medications, particularly in, in diabetics with um, nerve pain. Commonly, people with peripheral neuropathies um, will complain of numbness, and it's no wonder that in our animal species that it's difficult to identify and diagnose because certainly they can't describe this, nor can we see it when we look at them. Numbness uh, that accompanies peripheral neuropathy is commonly described by its distribution, commonly in the extremities. It can be described as a stocking or glove-like phenomenon. Not unlike when, for example, your leg or your arm might fall asleep with that pin and needles sensation when you've uh, kind of slept on it in an odd way. And in some instances, it can be accompanied with weakness, but not always. So again, in our animal species, patients, um, if they are simply numb, we may never actually know that from them. In addition to this phenomenon of numbness, Uh, and potentially weakness, there's an associated pain, and that's the focus of our discussion tonight. Humans can further characterize their pain and describe it, and it has been described in various ways. And certainly as one who lives with this, it can vary uh, from day to day in its intensity and its type. So pain can be described as burning, as shooting, as stabbing. Um, Some people will describe tingling, which for those of you in the audience, you may say, well, how could tingling be painful? But I can assure you that if you have persistent or intermittent tingling in in an extremity, um, it certainly is uh, distracting and uh, sometimes bothersome. And lastly, I'm sure all of my panel and those of you in the audience are looking at this image of a cell phone and asking why it's there. And I can attest to the fact that in some instances, the type of pain or discomfort that's uh, experienced is similar to um, a cell phone being, for example, set on vibrate mode. Some of us in this room can recall having carrying pagers or beepers and setting it in vibrate mode. Uh, Some of us have cell phones that we can set in vibrate mode, and you're very familiar with that buzzing, buzz, 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 intermittent kind of uh, phenomenon, and uh, imagine that being strapped to the underside of your foot or hand and experiencing that feeling. So again, um, our animals, our, our patients can't describe that to us, and it's no wonder that they have changes in their behavior. Dr. Elise Christensen Bell, who is going to speak to us a little bit more about when we might suspect neuropathic pain in our patients. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Berger, and uh, thank you all so much for coming tonight. I'm really honored that you're spending your time with us and to be on a panel with such smart people. So I'm going to talk about the behavioral aspect of this. We have some other vet minds discussing um, self-injurious behavior, and we're going to be talking about it more in January. But Certainly, the reason that clients come to see veterinarians is because they're actually noticing behavioral changes in their patients. So sometimes what happens is as clients are describing these changes in behavior, like the licking um, people have been alluding to, chewing or biting, and maybe even causing injury as they're doing it, hiding behaviors, things that might indicate that they're more sensitive than usual, not wanting to walk in areas that they've walked before, or a very common um, situation where I'll have a client call with abnormal behaviors, even in a patient that I'm already seeing for abnormal behaviors, so new abnormal behaviors, is when um, they start to notice the animal um, shaking or trembling or really lethargic um, in a situation where he hasn't been before. So when I have clients complaining about those things, I am very proactive about treating for discomfort for a variety of different modalities, and also making sure that we're assessing for anxiety. So common client complaints will make me be concerned about neuropathic pain are um, licking or chewing of the body in any, anywhere, actually, and changes in motor patterns, changes in willingness to play, lethargy, and generally any nonspecific signs that the client reports to me Pain is going to be um, on my list of differentials, and whether I can prove it or not, I may treat for it um, and do what's called an empirical trial. So I'm going to just test and see if my patient's clinical signs improve. Common clinical presentations are um, actually often 
clients come in to see me for a variety of other problems, and we discover that the patient has some symptoms that are consistent with discomfort and maybe neuronal discomfort. So that would be a case where, for instance, we have that cat come in that's urinating outside of the box, and maybe it's known that he's diabetic or not, and he's got this plantar grade stance that they were talking about earlier. And I was just so excited to hear uh, Dr. Zenger, um, I think it was, that was talking about the diabetics that have this discomfort. And I've been very concerned that we don't treat proactively for discomfort in our diabetics and other patients that have endocrine abnormalities. So we always have that on our list. And anytime the client is reporting that they're having new sensitivities in their patient. For instance, let's say that a seven-year-old dog comes in and has never had a problem with having people touch him along the back or the paws, and now he does, I'm going to be concerned that there could be some source for pain. So just as a definition, um, with self-injurious behavior being one of the very common signs of likely pain, neuropathic pain, or even orthopedic pain, that would see a veterinary behaviorist, just so you know, what I'm defining that is, is any action an animal performs that is directed towards his or her own body and causes injury or discomfort. So a common one here would be excessive grooming. Of course, there are many other medical differentials for excessive grooming, licking, chewing, or scratching besides pain. However, that is always on my list. We're going to be doing a good neurologic and orthopedic exam on those patients whenever it's safe to do so. So the differential list, and this is probably not even um, complete, actually, for uh, self there are some um, behavioral differentials here, and that's why often and whenever possible, veterinary behaviorists, if they have the opportunity, will work with people that are really interested in pain management during the course of these types of cases because we may want to do a diagnostic nerve block or we may want to do additional pain medication trials, but having to balance our anti-anxiety trials uh, medications as well, um, because these things can really coexist and make each other worse. So we're going to treat any underlying anxiety disorders, fear-related behaviors, aggression, growling, snarling, snapping, biting, whatever context that's coming in, because to the extent that the patient is injuring him or herself or others, um, or experiencing distress, if we don't treat that, we may not have as much success as we'd like with the pain. And if we don't treat the pain, of course, we can't help this patient be less anxious in a really robust way.